Um, we will be covering more information regarding our proposed hybrid learning model which is part of um, our on the dial uh, choice with in-person, um, the, the distance learning and the hybrid. So you'll find out more information about the hybrid model as well as our revised calendar dates. Um, right now we do have a family survey out until August 9th. And um, we unfortunately are going to be um, bothering and contacting families nonstop until August 9th because we need your input and information. I've had um, many, many questions and emails coming in about this. We're hoping to uh, provide some more information tonight. And everybody out there that sent me an email, I will get to you. We, um, I will get to you in the next day or two. Um, after this board meeting, we'll have more time. And so the families with the survey that's due August 9th, we um, have a lot of input coming in, but we still need everyone's participation. We've asked for basically the main choices. There are several questions on there, but the one that we really need um, to know is, are you choosing an online learning for the year or not the year? We don't wanna lock you into that, just a term, which we're saying that's a quarter at the elementary level or a semester at the secondary level. We want to offer families choice. Um, number of our school districts in our surrounding areas have asked families to lock in their choice for an entire year. We are going to try and, and offer some flexibility with that, even though uh, it can be somewhat um, complex to change after that. We want to do that for families. So online, first choice, that is steady. You know what you're getting. You don't have that change. Um, one teacher with the, the kids. Um, the other choice is if you don't mind change and you do have daycare lined up if you do need that, you would be in either online or distance learning or in-person learning or hybrid learning. And it can change within a matter of um, hours if we were in-person or hybrid and there happened to be a case of COVID in a classroom. And if they met all of the requirements for quarantine, um, the entire class possibly um, might be out on quarantine for 14 days, and then you need to, um, if they're elementary age, have that child care lined up. So what we really need you to know now is online is steady, and you know what you're going to get. Um, the On the dial, the um, choices are the distance, the hybrid, and the in-person. We'll tell you a little bit more about that. So the governor and MDE came out last week with our Minnesota Safe Learning Plan for our upcoming school year, and they provided us a five-step decision-making process. The first step, we need to consider county-level data to determine MDE's recommended base learning model. And with that, they're pulling data um, every Thursday at 11 o'clock. You can go online, I believe. Um, we're adding that link to MDE's website, to our website. Uh, they just pulled it today, and it looks at cases per 10,000 um, within a county. The first date they have in um, their document was on May 31st, and we're seeing a trajectory um, going up in cases. May 31st, they had 5.37, then it went to 6.32, 8.92, 10.74, 12.74, Fifteen and now today, as of eleven o'clock, fifteen point six three. Um, maybe with the the mask mandate um, coming out, the rates might don't go down slightly. We hope, but we're just not seeing that. Um, I am working with MDE has assigned us some county um, health department um, facilitators. I'll be working with uh, Chris Keller, an epidemiologist. David Brummel, a health deputy director, and Douglas Berglund, director of emergency management. Um, they've been in contact with me. Uh, we will be working closely to monitor these numbers and see what it means when we are going to make decisions about our mode of learning. The second step, consult with the health officials. Um, that's what I just talked about, is it, we'll look at the local data. Uh, we do have um, a prison in our county. We do have um, some retirement homes, some nursing homes where uh, COVID um, can run higher, and so that's why we do want to work with these um, officials. The third step, we would evaluate our district's ability to implement required and recommended protocols, such as staffing, transportation, supplies, um, protocols when there's a, a case of COVID, and physical distancing. 
Uh, we do have out a survey for licensed teachers right now to see if they do have health conditions um, and see if they are able to return to the classroom this next year. It's also due August 9th. We need to know that as well to help the staff for the upcoming school year. Um, we're also looking at possibly needing more custodians, um, healthcare workers to assist with our children, possible nutritional staff, um, paras, extra subs. We're looking at all of the different um, staff groups right now to see what we need to support our students and our staff. Transportation, um, we're looking at that at 50% um, capacity. We, to do the physical distancing needed on a bus, which usually holds 60 something students, we need to be down to about 23 students. So that limits us. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later in our presentation. Supplies, we do have um, plenty of cleaning supplies. Uh, right now we have um, hand sanitizing stations. We're good right now, um, but we, we hope with all of our orders that we do get them throughout the school year. Um, it, with all the school districts ordering this, we're a little bit worried about that. Uh, we're working with Lakeview Hospital. I will meet with them tomorrow morning. Uh, might be able to possibly tap into their supply chain. Um, Minnesota Department of Education, they are also sending us out. I just um, checked uh, thousands and thousands of masks for our, uh, those are disposable masks as well as cloth masks for our students and staff and some face shields for the adults. They should be on their way. We've also ordered um, cloth masks uh, for all of our students and staff and face shields for our staff as well. So we're looking at, at um, our operational, uh, our operation um, capacity. Uh, is it safe and can we support our students? Can we support our staff? The fourth step in the decision-making process is to determine the learning model to begin the school year. Um, if you look at the chart, um, over here on the right, the number of cases per 10,000 over 14 days. Uh, right now we fall uh, with 15.63 cases per 10,000. 10, we fall within the 10 to 19 uh, range, which means in-person learning for elementary students, hybrid learning for secondary. Uh, we feel like we need to be a little bit more restrictive than that because we need to make sure we can staff appropriately. We need to make sure that the transportation works, uh, the physical distancing, the picking up meals, all of that goes into it uh, right now. Um, the, the fifth step would be to monitor community and school level impact of COVID on a regular basis and adjust if needed. Okay, so our administration's recommendation, as I said, to begin the year in a hybrid learning model for all students. Uh, schools will follow all safety protocols and guidelines for face coverings, physical distancing, and cleaning and sanitizing, and will operate at about 50% capacity, both in schools and on buses. Priority will be to schedule families together on the same day. That is the top priority. I've had some questions on that. Also, the buses, I've had some questions about neighborhoods being together. With this proposal on a hybrid with an A, B, A, B, um, C day, we have a group of students, half of our students would be in the A group, the other half would be in a B group. Um, we want to be able to go in and out of a hybrid model, in-person model, um, back and forth if we need to. So we are routing through the neighborhoods Buses will go through and pick up the A students on a route. The B students, a bus will also go through the same exact route and pick them up. So neighborhoods will most likely be split in half. So we have the same route running A day, same route running B day. So we can seamlessly go back and forth between in-person and hybrid. And we do that because if we don't, it could take multiple days to reroute all of those um, buses and we want um, the students in school if at all possible. Um, families and staff will need to be flexible and have alternative plans should we move to in-person or distance learning, district-wide or an individual school or classroom level. So again, the surveys out with families, do you want your child to be in an online learning program and commit to a quarter at the elementary or semester at secondary? Or do you want to choose the on the dial plan 
with a possibility of in-learning, hybrid, or distance learning. Okay, this is a sample of our proposed hybrid schedule. Group A would be attending school on Monday, Wednesday. Um, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday would be the online or distance learning at home. Group B would then show up to school on Tuesday and Thursday with their distance learning on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, there's multiple options with the A, A, B, B, C, or A, B, A, B, C day, working with teachers and administrators across the district. Uh, many teachers did not want to do an A, A, uh, C, B, B day because they did not want to go that long without connecting with students. Uh, we're hearing from families, they need that social emotional support. Um, also with the instruction, teachers would want to instruct on a Monday, make sure that they're, um, they can go home, they're doing their work, they come back on a Wednesday, they can check in with them again. And then the C day Friday is a learning day, but it's distant learning. So that will give families more options with a three day possibility of a weekend where the student on a Friday could be anywhere and still complete their schoolwork. Okay, so now I have um, some elementary principles here to explain more um, in depth about our elementary hybrid model. Thank you, Melinda. I'm going to start. Thank you, Melinda. I'll start. Um, board Chair Stivlin, Board Directors, and community members that are tuning in to watch. Um, this is indeed a challenging decision. Um, and I think I speak for the entire 834 staff when I say that all of us in our hearts really wanted to start the year in person. And I want to let you know that what we are presenting is a thoughtful approach based on the safety of staff and students, as well as the diverse needs of our students. And that includes academic needs, that includes the social emotional learning. I've been doing this 36 years and rarely have I faced a challenge with so many variables that raise so many complex um, and challenging decisions um, for, the, for all of um, the leaders to have to make. So um, I applaud my colleagues for the work that they've done um, throughout the summer, uh, including the teachers. We have worked uh, through the month of July to come up with the hybrid plan. We've engaged uh, about 100 teachers just at the elementary level to get their feedback. And we've explored a number of different options. And I'm gonna turn it over to Derek Berg, the principal at Stonebridge, to talk a little bit about why specifically the ABABC model for our elementary students. Thanks, Stephen. John, can you can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. All right. I'll, uh, I'll send a request for the camera. Yeah, my video is not activating now. It's tough as principals. We like to look good. <laughs> All right. You should be good to go. Uh, Chair Stivlin, members of the board, Superintendent Lansfeld, thanks for having uh, Mr. Gordy and myself here. Uh, this evening. So as you look at this slide uh, that's on the screen, I'm going to be focusing my time tonight really on the center section. We have a pretty good sense of in-person learning, which is in the left column, because that's what we've traditionally done. And we have a sense of distance learning because that's what we experienced last spring. Uh, but the focus tonight for us is going to be on the, the center uh, section of the slide. So uh, it's important to know that a hybrid format will require flexibility for teachers and for families as we move across each of the three learning formats based on COVID numbers. Just because we start in one format 
doesn't mean that we will be in that format for the entire year. So just as Melinda was talking about earlier, we could be in more than one format over the course of the year. So families selecting the, the hybrid option really have to be prepared to be flexible um, with childcare and with other opportunities as we could be in more than one of those uh, tracks throughout the year. Um, so why the AB, ABC model? Uh, tonight, I just wanna share some of the opportunities identified while working with our teachers in July. Uh, first, it provides a, a combination of teacher support in person with at-home learning throughout the week. Teachers like the idea of being in front of students on Monday and then sending them home prepared for at-home learning on Tuesday and then reconnecting with them in person on Wednesday. Um, the teacher input led us to this model as it provides touch points at the beginning of the week and at the end of the week. Otherwise, if we had two in-person days back to back, there would be two days compressed together and then students would have five days consecutively where they wouldn't be in front of their, their teacher. So this provides a touch point at the beginning of the week and at the end of the week. And I think another opportunity that we uh, have talked about is that we can leverage smaller class sizes. Melinda also spoke about uh, having half the class on the A cohort and half the class in the B cohort. And it can provide opportunities for one-to-one -one small group instruction. Uh, smaller class groupings also allow greater opportunities to build relationships and community uh, for, for our students. We'll be talking about relationships uh, a little bit more coming up. Uh, this time I'm going to turn it back to Mr. Gordy so he can talk about uh, the C-Day. So Melinda had laid out the AB, AB model, and then we are going to have a C day. Uh, a C day is a learning day. The C day is an instructional day with an opportunity for students to be learning online. There's a little bit of background and some rationale there. Number one, it will be a district wide option K-12. So you'll hear the middle school and high school administrators um, talk about that as well. Uh, it really gives our staff, our custodial staff, an opportunity to do that deep clean. And there are opportunities on the C day for staff to collaborate. This is really important to recognize that collaboration increases the quality of instruction. So we really value that opportunity for that collaboration and the work for teachers to do uh, across schools. Again, with the purpose of raising the quality of instruction. We know uh, as we talk about the flexibility of learning on the dial that we likely will be in between a number of these different options. By having a C day as a distance day, it gives our teachers and our students an opportunity to work and experience the different platforms and the different instructional um, opportunities that will be presented in a distance learning or an online learning session. All right, thanks, Stephen. Uh, know that our focus to start the year is going to be on the, the social emotional needs of our kids. Uh, we do wanna build the community and the relationships. We'll also be supporting students who will all be establishing new routines and understanding the safety requirements as we know the return to school looks so different than it did uh, just a year ago. Social, social emotional learning such as uh, responsive classroom will continue to be used. We'll continue on with our Ready, Set, Go conferences as well. Uh, know that there is more planning and more details to be determined for the scheduling of specialists and intervention and special education and also know that principals will be providing more details to families on safety protocols and procedures as they are established. And with that, Stephen and I are going to turn this over to our middle school colleagues. So take it away, Principal Van Scoy and Principal Fields. While they're teeing up, I just want to say we are not forgetting about the GATE program. 
Uh, that's kind of in between elementary students at Stillwater Middle School. Uh, they are not on this um, report, but we are thinking about you. We know those are elementary age students um, in a secondary school. So more to come on that. I know I'll get questions. So thank you. Great. Uh, uh, Superintendent Lansfeld, thank you for saying that about the GATE program. The GATE program is housed at Stillwater Middle School, and I'm Eric Van Scoy, the principal at Stillwater Middle School. And I believe uh, Principal Fields from Oakland Middle School is here as well. Principal Fields, you want to say hi to everybody? Good evening, everybody. Board Chair Stivland, members of the board, and Superintendent um, Lansfeld, it's, it's great to be here to share our thoughts and to provide a little bit more insight into this model and where we're at. And, and similar to our colleagues at the elementary level, it's important uh, for us to share uh, that in a perfect world, we'd be planning to see students in person every single day. And as, as educators, that's what we uh, really get excited about um, is to be working uh, with our students um, in the settings uh, to really promote learning, social emotional learning, academic growth and all those things. And, and this, um, these unique times have provided challenges for us to be able to do that, but we are committed to that. And we wanna let our students know that we uh, cannot wait to work with them this school year. And I, I think with that, I'll let Eric start and talk a little bit about our model. So um, as we transition from an elementary hybrid model into a middle school model, one of the challenges we started to um, think about is all of a sudden you have you know, roughly 500 students who are going to be um, moving through a building um, having passing times over seven periods in a school day. Um, so as we started to really engage with our teachers in early July, the question was, how are we going to make sure that that is, that is safe? We've never done hybrid learning before, um, and we've never been in a pandemic before. So how are we going to make sure that as kids move throughout the building, they're safe? And so as we worked with them, we started to look at... Um, maybe really thinking about our kids as who they are, which are middle school kids. And that when they enter middle school, they're transitioning from an elementary model. And of course, by the time they leave, they're high school students. They are really in the middle. And so we needed to take a different approach uh, to how we look at the hybrid model uh, to start the school year. So we have two different uh, hybrids that we'll be using this year. One in which we will start the year, which we're calling the bubble model. And we call it the bubble model because it, um, it isolates a little bit more our classes so that we can ensure that our kids and teachers are safe as we start the year and start to um, understand what this is gonna look like within a um, large secondary school. Um, we're proposing that we do this, this bubble model, which asks about, um, uh, which asks kids to be in an advisory class uh, on their A day or B day. That advisory class is roughly 15 students per class and that they would do all of their content learning with their content area teacher online in that classroom. So what that means is um, your advisory teacher is there building relationships with you and teaching you how to use the online environment while you might be interacting with teachers um, who are in the uh, classroom next door. Uh, this doesn't mean that you're not going to be moving throughout the building. We're just limiting the uh, amount of times you do move. So for instance, we're still going to offer, um, you know, physical education and possibly another elective or real course that we offer in the middle school. And students will be able to transition to those classes um, so that they can get some of the physical movement and uh, some of the hands-on learning uh, that they so desire as they enter the middle school. It's also important to note that during this advisory bubble model, of course, we'll be utilizing the outdoors um, a lot and utilizing all the different spaces within the school. So students won't be stuck in one place, um, but they will have the support of that one teacher and move as an advisory cohort throughout the day just to make sure that we're um, limiting the spread of this virus as we start school. We've seen in some other states where our schools have, or their, their schools have started and within a several hours, they've had to shut down school because of cases of COVID. And our goal is to make sure that if we bring kids into school, we keep them in school as long as possible. We also know that at some point, we're probably gonna go 
into a distance learning format somewhere during the school year. And we wanna make sure that we take time at the beginning of the year to teach your kids how to navigate that online environment. And so by starting in a bubble, and really it, we're, we're looking at um, having it for just about four and a half weeks is what it ends up being if we look at September 10th through October 14th, which is when MEA is. Um, having them in that bubble allows us uh, to watch them as they practice the online environment and help them understand what to do. So as parents um, have to welcome them back home into a distance learning format, maybe later this school year, uh, the kids know what to do and aren't coming to the parents while they're in their work meeting uh, ask, you know, asking for help. Mr. Fields? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's important also as we, as we look at all of these models, we are looking to provide 100% of the instruction and standards uh, for each content area for our students. And so there is a lot of uh, work that needs to be done in order to make this happen. And while the pandemic is new to the 2021 school year, it certainly wasn't new to us last year in trying to make this work. However, last year, uh, we looked at providing 60%. Um, and, and as we move forward to this year, we wanna make sure that all of our students are prepared to understand and be able to be have access to 100% of the curriculum. So as they move forward in our organization, there aren't any learning gaps that exist. I think it's important to note that within this hybrid um, bubble model, we also are looking out for our sixth grade students who have not had the opportunity to transition. These are students that typically in the fifth grade have had multiple touch points to come into our building, uh, to, to meet staff, to meet um, people that they're going to be working with, to understand the physical space of our building, and they simply haven't had that. And so we wanna create a safe environment for those students. We also know that we have uh, seventh and eighth graders coming in that spent the entire quarter not being in their middle school last year. We want to reintroduce them in the safest way possible and knowing how unpredictable this COVID virus is, we want to ensure that we have everything our students need to be able to do if we have to have them learning from home. And so I think the hybrid model to start the year, um, while it seems like for four weeks, you know, they would be with one teacher and we would limit uh, the traveling throughout our building, uh, as Eric said, there are still multiple opportunities to move in our building, whether through lunch, through FIED, uh, and, and other interactions. Uh, but it does put us in a, the safest spot possible. And for four weeks, what that means is that's eight days for each of our students, if there is learning, uh, that's two days in person in this hybrid model. I think those are the parts that I wanted to point out, Eric. I also want to say, um, I talked about September 10th through October 14th, and some of you may be wondering, what are we doing on September 8th and September 9th? It's important to note that we are going to be hosting our web um, program to all of our sixth grade students um, at our schools um, for students who want to participate in that on September 8th and September 9th. So please know that we're doing everything that we can to introduce our sixth grade students uh, to uh, our middle schools. Um, I also want to state that I think most of us tomorrow will be sending more information to families that have specifics about our schools uh, uh, in regards to how we're planning to start the school year. So please be looking for communication from uh, your principals tomorrow. Eric spoke a little bit earlier about how we're uniquely positioned between our elementary school and our high school. And there is a continuum in the elementary school that is far more dependent. Our students are far more dependent on the adults to our high school where our students become progressively more independent. Um, we believe that we have a, a dial here that really supports where we are at in the middle between both our elementary model and our high school's model. And as we look at that bubble, um, we are excited to move into the hybrid full schedule. Again, all of this are in draft form right now, and we're able to respond to the needs of our, our families, um, and our students, and our staff. Uh, and so if we move, or when we're ready to move into that hybrid model, um, as Eric talked about, the full hybrid model, um, then we would be looking at students moving throughout the building in their current schedule. And we would then move into what we would call a blended learning opportunity. So students that are going to their science, English, social studies, or math classes um, on their natural schedule would have the ability to access curriculum in the hybrid model through online, but they would be interacting with their teachers at school while they are present. Um, in doing so, they're going to be able to have intervention uh, enrichment and other kind of enhancements, working with um, 
working with other students in small groups. Um, and so we think that this is a nice transition as we move from that hybrid advisory bubble, the safest model we can provide at school, and then ultimately into a hybrid full schedule where students are moving about our building, um, following their normal schedule in a hybrid A, B, A, B, C schedule. So Eric, I don't know if you wanna speak a little bit more to our hybrid full schedule. It's, it's basically exactly what um, Mr. Fields just said. It really is as close to running school as you can get without having everybody there. And so that's our goal. We want school to feel like school and we want our middle schools to feel like um, middle school. So um, our goal is to get to that hybrid full schedule uh, as soon as we can. Our, and our best guess right now is that we are gonna need to go until MEA to feel like we can move into that. Um, so we're really excited to welcome kids back into the building. Uh, uh, our custodians and staff have been working hard to set up rooms to make sure that um, desks are, um, you know, there are only 15 desks in a room and that they're six feet apart. Uh, we'll be sharing some pictures of what that looks like for families uh, as these weeks uh, continue. Um, we're just excited to get back to work with kids and uh, interact with them mask to mask. So I believe next we have our high school team. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Principal Vanskoy and uh, Principal Fields for turning it over to me. Um, thank you also to Superintendent Lansfeld and uh, Board Chair Stivlin, members of the board. Um, I'm pleased to talk with you this evening a little bit about the plan for Stillwater Area High School and what our hybrid model would look like. Um, as has been mentioned a couple of times before by, by some of my colleagues, really what I'm going to emphasize here for you is the, the middle column here. Um, we're talking about the, the hybrid piece and the reason that we're talking about that is because for the most part, we have an understanding of what in-person learning looks like because we've been doing that for quite some time. And we have a pretty decent understanding of what a distance learning platform could look like because we obviously had an experiment with that back last, uh, last spring. And what we know is that as we develop a hybrid model, the, one of the main keys is, is that whatever model we settle on has to allow the flexibility to go back and forth between an in-person model. If things loosen up, if we have a vaccine, if the, the masks suddenly take and, and suddenly our, our numbers um, begin to go down. And likewise, we need the, the flexibility of being able to go back to a, a distance learning model in case the opposite happens. And in case the, there's some kind of an outbreak or a, we see a spike in numbers, we need to be prepared to do that. So our hybrid model has to represent a schedule and a structure that gives us the flexibility to be able to move, as Superintendent Lansfeld has said, kind of along the dial. And the hybrid model that we've settled at at Stillwater Area High School that we'd like to propose really is something that I feel reflects um, the lessons that we learned from our experiment with distance learning back last spring. And really some of those lessons kind of take shape from the standpoint of um, trying to balance out an instructional model with the safety that we know we need to maintain for both our students and our staff. And as far as the instruction is concerned, essentially what our hybrid model looks like is, um, as everyone knows on a hybrid model, we have to get down to roughly 50% of our capacity. That means we run essentially an A and a B schedule. So we have one group of students that's identified as an A cohort. We have one group of students that's identified as a B cohort. And so on Monday, our A students would be in our building. On Tuesday, our B students would be in our building. On Wednesday, our A students would be back in. And on Thursday, our B students would be back in with the idea that typically on a, on a typical Friday, that would be what we call a C day. And that would be an online learning day for just about everyone. The basic crux of our, our model entails a three period day, whereby essentially each class that we would be offering would be run on essentially a block format. Currently or traditionally in the high school, each of our periods has been just under an hour, right around 53 minutes or so. And what we are proposing on a three period block type schedule is lengthening each of those class periods out to somewhere between 80 to 85 minutes. What we would be running then is we'd be running three of those block sessions 
from roughly from the morning when students arrive up until at some point in the afternoon, at which point there'd be a break for lunch. But we can, we can squeeze three of those 80 minute class periods in during that time. And essentially those three class periods would be uh, the schedule then for our students. As pretty much everyone here I think knows, traditionally our students have a, a six period day um, at the high school. They have six periods as part of their, their class schedule. Well, one of the lessons again that we had learned through our experiment with distance learning back last spring was that six classes is an awful lot to manage, especially when you're trying to navigate new platforms with regard to online and different teachers are at different stages of, of where they're able to, to execute. And so we're trying to streamline that a little bit um, for our students and so that they can take advantage of a better learning experience. This allows them to be a little bit more organized and also um, we're looking for a little bit more of a synchronous kind of a, a platform as opposed to the asynchronous, not in time learning experiences that students went through back last spring. So what this will do for us then is it'll allow students to have only three classes during their schedule. And on that block schedule, they'll take those three classes during the course of first quarter. So during first quarter, they'd have, let's call it um, in our example that we're, that we're toying with right now, first period, third period and fifth period. And so um, again, students would have those three periods and then during second quarter, those three classes would change to second period, fourth period and sixth period. So essentially what we would be looking to do is we would be looking to take a semester's worth of content and putting it into a quarter on the block schedule. The other piece that, the, that, the, that our hybrid model has is in the afternoon after things open up uh, during lunch a little bit is we would have another section of time that would be essentially an office hours time whereby students would be able to reach out virtually to their teachers and meet with their teachers to get uh, assistance, get tutoring, get questions answered, help with homework, perhaps even additional um, discussion groups, all of, those, um, all of those pieces could be done in the afternoon. And what our proposal is in, in high school is, is that when that lunch period rolls around for students, because we know, um, as Principal Fields talked about, um, the high school is at a slightly developmentally different uh, point in time than middle school students or, or elementary students, and a great number of our students transport themselves, what we'd be looking to do is at lunch, students that transport themselves would have the freedom to be released from school to go home and run that afternoon learning session from home. So they would have three class periods in person with their teacher, they'd be released and the students that uh, depend on us for lunch and depend on us for transportation would be housed in the, the building with a separate schedule um, whereby we would work with them through that last session. Uh, but our other students then would be able to, to be released um, to go home. That's one of the pieces that speaks to the safety uh, measures that we are taking within the building. And as I mentioned before, I think the, the goal and, and the, the way we feel about this particular model is that we've kind of hit the sweet spot in between offering an instructional model that works for students and safety. You know, I mentioned again that traditionally our students have a, a six period day. And with a six period day, we know that that's an awful lot of contact points. If we were to try to run a regular um, schedule, even on an A day and a B day, we know that we'd have a number of different students coming into contact with each other, with teachers through passing time. And we feel that a three period day will mitigate that a little bit, but also provide us with an instructional model where our teachers will be able to do their best work um, reaching out to, to students. Um, again, what this does for us is it gives us the flexibility to go back and forth between an in-person model and a distance learning model. If we do hit a point in time where we do need to shift to distance learning, this is a schedule that we can very easily replicate because the template will already be in place uh, because on any given day, a number of our learners will be learning from home. So for example, on a Monday, let's call that an A day, our A group is learning with their three classes in person, while the B group is actually learning from those three classes at home. So the template will already be there. 
And if we had to switch to distance learning, one potential piece is, is we might even be able to, to theoretically move away from the A days and B days because there wouldn't necessarily be a need for that. But the basic structure of having a three period day with synchronous learning opportunities in the morning and then a more asynchronous learning time in the afternoon, as well as maintaining the flexibility that our students really appreciated on distance learning helps us keep the high points of what we learned from the, the spring while also um, clearly refining it and offering a, a better experience for our students. And uh, I think that speaks to, to most of the elements of the, the high school model. And with that, I'll, I'll turn things over to whoever's next. Okay, we have the St. Croix Valley Area Learning Center up next. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Lansfield. I appreciate that. Greetings board, Chair Stivland, and also members of the community and members of the board. I am Mary Leadham Tichu. I, um, like Stephen Gordy, I'm in my 36th year in education and am enjoying the opportunity that 20 years I spent with the Stillwater schools. So five being with alternative education. Our model too will focus on hybrid learning, but I want you to know that our students and families know that they're going to learn safely no matter what we choose, because we're going to focus on existing relationships. We have about 10 new students coming in this year. And the students that I've talked to this week have told us that they want to come back, but only if it's safe. We've only had a handful tell us they want online learning separate from the ALC's distance process. So we're gonna persevere this pandemic this fall. With reaching out to families, we know that they care. We know that the teachers care as well about the safety and well-being. So this hybrid model gives us that fluid model of moving between in-person and being ready to go back to the things that make us an alternative center, but also we can implement distance learning immediately. So we're excited about that. Keep in mind that alternative education has parameters, um, including uh, a continuous learning plan. Every learner has their own continuous learning plan. So we can personalize for every single student as to how they fill their day. But we're projecting the A, B, A, B, C model with five days of instructional time. We would have students like the high school in the building every other day, but not like the high school. We need to offer six classes every day. And you might ask why? Well, 55 of our students are 12th graders and 55 of our students need all 12 credits, some even more. So if we would only offer a small amount and they weren't successful, we might find ourselves not finding an equitable access for learning for those learners with advanced um, opportunity. We need to offer advancement. So each student with their CLP will determine whether or not they're going to go on a faster pace. Our students used the Google Docs with great success last year. And we will also use Google Classroom and Schoology. Um, what we find is that we don't really provide online lesson design. We launch online, but we still want to capture the spirit of curiosity and alternatives with partnerships. So for instance, we want to continue the idea that we're going to work with our black, indigenous and people of color, which we know our building right now um, has a opportunity to plan some opportunities for um, working with um, indigenous trauma and trying to have those conversation with experts in the field who also represent people of color. We also know that there's a pollinator project because we've recently received a donation of uh, access to land in our community. And we know that we can go on land with great opportunity and social distancing. We also have specific electives that involve the creeks and the community in Stillwater. And we wanna continue those options. And those are not online courses, but they're delivered through that hybrid instruction. And even if we go distance learning, there's still opportunities for learners. Every day is an instructional day. And for our students, what we discovered was that they like to access learning at night. We cannot shift our schedule that dramatically, but we will definitely receive content and be able to receive and deliver content in the evenings through that hybrid model with everything being launched in asynchronous lessons. Our mornings are gonna be three period classes where they're assigned to their teachers and our afternoons are gonna be learning labs. So we'll actually have what we call a four point access. So there will be, we will be limiting the movement because we know that some of our spaces in the LC are just not large enough for six feet, at least not for a full class of 15. 
we don't know at this time who's coming back, but we will soon. But my, my checking this week is that the students want to return and they're comfortable with the hybrid, but they want to come back to classes. So I can't wait till we can reopen the school as you can see on this graphic, because when we do, we can go back to the pack. We can go back again to the idea of bringing gatherings down to industrial tech. We can continue to gather larger groups with panels with community members. But what we know right now is what we have to do is for the safety of our students. And our students will still be able to maximize their learning in those A, B, A, B, C settings. If you have any questions, we're gonna post some things online. We know that we can go into distance learning overnight. I don't think that question will be uh, posed to us that quickly, but if it is, we're ready for that because we will launch all of our assignments on a weekly basis. And that's what the Friday Collaborative Time is for. But more than that, Friday Collaborate is also where we do our Minnesota Early Intervention Response Services. And we really respond. If, if you can keep in mind that alternative schools are 100% students who have demonstrated at some point they needed that extra surround of support. So we support them every day, but we do that extra intervention with intensity, with partnerships on Fridays. We will also be launching learning on Fridays and collaborating with other content specialists, even in the high school, because we know that our, our, our partners in the content areas are across the hall. If you have any questions, please know that I'm happy to answer them and I'm excited that you brought me on board today, Melinda. Thanks for inviting me to the table. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Um, next we have special ed. Yes, uh, board chair and board members and superintendent, thank you again for having me uh, participate in the meeting this, this evening. Um, first thing I wanna say is I our, our special ed staff has been working extremely hard. We've pulled in a lot of our staff to build our programs um, over the summer. And I just wanna extend my a great level of appreciation for all the hard work that they've put in thus far. And I'm excited to share some of the basics of what we'll be doing um, so our families have some ideas with that. Um, first of all, you know, our, our students who receive special ed services will follow their grade level hybrid model that's been so well presented this evening by our principals. Um, with that, um, the students will be provided their direct um, special education services outlined in their IEPs. And those IEPs will be, um, meetings will be held with, with all families to discuss those and how those are best uh, designed to meet the individual needs of the students within the current hybrid programming at their age level. Um, the, we are going to be um, prioritizing and working with families to prioritize those services, those critical services um, for the student with the efforts to schedule those during the uh, in-school days. Um, and with that said, our, all of our students who received special ed services, you know, they will fall in their A or B cohort with their classmates and will follow that schedule. The one thing I really want to point out is that our case managers will be very closely monitoring progress um, as we enter into this year and in the hybrid programming. Um, and additional services and supports and interventions will be added as uh, determined by IEP teams. Um, and this responsive approach is illustrated in this graphic that you see here. Um, as you see the top fan or dial in this graphic, this all represents kind of the hybrid programming. Um, however, it would apply to in, a full in-school programming as well as distance as well. Um, but what, what this demonstrates is that what we'll be doing is as a student is progressing, if, if we're monitoring their progress and they're not making progress on their goals and objectives that are individualized for them, we will be meeting and be looking at how do we add services and supports. What are the services that are best provided or most effective in the online format with direct um, face, you know, online direct um, services from our uh, therapists and clinicians um, and teachers? Um, and which ones do we need to enhance within the, in the time in which they're in school? Um, in addition, um, our IEP teams will be working in collaboration with our families um, and we'll prioritize, well, again, prioritize that in-school time for our students that are with highly specialized and complex needs. And we've actually reached, I, I believe we've reached out to all of those families to start communication regarding what those plans would be for our, 
um, our students with the most complex needs and services. Um, with that said, we'll continue um, with our evaluation and MTSS systems to identify students that may not uh, be currently receiving services that will uh, may need those um, now and in the future. So all those sort of systems will continue as within the hybrid model as well. Um, we look forward to sending out additional information. I believe we have a, a nice communication with much more detail on our special ed programming uh, being sent out to all special ed families um, tomorrow morning. Um, so I think those are the highlights um, for special ed. Thank you again for the opportunity. Okay, and thank you so much. Um, I would also like to add that we are having our counselors, um, school psychologists, our student advocates or social workers, um, they are all beginning to meet to put together um, uh, support for our students and our staff with the um, mental health and the social emotional support that they need. Um, I have put this all along and um, everybody has been in agreement that um, I've been able to collaborate, collaborate with. Um, we need to do everything um, this year with an equity lens and not only an equity lens. Somebody just told me uh, the other day, you can take the lens on and off. We all need to be equity practitioners. And that is our goal to take action on that um, with these plans and put um, that process and those actions into everything we do with this. Okay. So um, I would like to thank everybody that's um, presented tonight that um, has really helped me. It's yes. helped hopefully a lot of families and staff to understand the hybrid um, learning model a little bit better. And families, this is, this is your choice. The survey is due by um, August 9th. We, we need your input. So you can choose between learning on the dial, which is the best option for families who want the in-person experiences for their students. Um, families choosing this model will need to be flexible and have alternative plans. Uh, could be on a very short notice as it's likely we'll need to be moving in between the in-person, the hybrid or the distance learning uh, district-wide or at a school or even within a classroom. The other choice will be 100% online learning. This option is best for families who have medical concerns or just don't feel comfortable returning to school. This option offers consistencies or consistency for families that, that really need it. Um, right now, uh, we met with teachers. Um, I, I am hearing a lot of teachers. I'm hearing a lot of family input. Um, we are listening. This is a lot of tough, complex decisions that need to be made. We want to, it's um, emotional, people can be scared. We want to look at the data and the science. Uh, the in-person, even though the COVID rates, county COVID rates for Washington County uh, show elementary in-person, we just, we don't um, want to take that risk right now because operationally, um, we don't know that we can, we don't think we, or believe we can pull it off. Um, uh, it would be the um, possible lack of, of subs. Most of our subs, a lot of our subs are retirees. A lot of the um, bus drivers um, have been retirees. Uh, we might be short on them. The uh, buses need to be um, at probably close to a third capacity with 23 on a bus. Uh, staffing, we need to make sure that we can staff all areas, not only teachers, but uh, nutritional staff, health staff, uh, custodial and engineer staff and the supplies, we have enough now, we want to make sure that they continue to come in. Um, we also know that this is a big change for our students. We want to make sure that they understand what physical distancing is. We need this slow start. Um, it, it will look different, it will feel different. We need to build those relationships. We need to teach students the tools that they will need to have. Um, we will have ages five and up, The face coverings, and that's going to be a big change. Uh, I've taught kindergarten before, that is going to be a, at least a week um, of modeling and walking through the guidelines. Um, it, it's just going to take some time. So right now, uh, we are recommending starting in the hybrid. We're recommending that because it's kind of the, the, the best of both worlds right now. Um, I, I'm hearing from a lot of parents that really want that in person. 
And then we're hearing from a lot of staff that they're, they're worried, they're, they're not children, they're adults, so they're more at risk. Uh, we need things to be safe. Um, we're, we are listening and I, I will share um, my own personal um, uh, family. We do have a health risk. My husband um, last summer um, was diagnosed with osteomycolis and was on um, life support for probably at least a month and still has double pneumonia. So I do know your concerns and, and we will take it um, very serious. So with the hybrid, um, we, we think it is best. We, we do want that face-to-face. -face. We want to build connections. Last spring when we went into distance learning, we had pre-established relationships. We need those relationships with the kids. Um, we, we want to provide that as much as we possibly can in a safe environment. We want to try and address both the needs of, of families wanting their children in school and, and teachers wanting to be safe. Uh, families also want to be safe as well. Uh, the relationships, again, I cannot emphasize that and teaching students the tools, um, how to use them. So when we are in, in uh, possible distance learning mode, they can utilize them successfully um, and effectively. Uh, with this hybrid model, you need to know that we are planning five days of the distance or online learning. Um, that is our base foundation. And then teachers on the two days a week can really make those connections, check in with kids, support them and provide that instruction. Um, it, it's the social emotional support as well as the academic support. Um, with the choices, um, we know it's hard. Uh, we want to try and answer your questions. We do not have all of the details on this. We will continue to provide all the information we can. We want to have accurate information. Uh, this is uh, one of the big reasons why we, um, thank you to the school board, have delayed the start of the school year by one week. So we have two weeks, half a month, to bring everybody together to do a lot of planning. And um, I saw the, the uh, list of dates and trainings and professional development already lined up. And uh, our, our curriculum department, learning and innovation department, they put a lot of time and effort into this as well as uh, teachers um, across the district. Um, I would also like to thank, uh, we've had a, a slow start this summer with all of our programming. I want to thank all of the staff. Um, we are essential workers. Um, our staff are out on the front line and they have done a fabulous job this summer. Our nutritional staff, um, they've served probably thousands and thousands of meals uh, for our families in our district. The custodians, engineers, they have been cleaning and cleaning and cleaning our um, schools. Um, we have paras ready to go. They're, they'll be coming in for training. Uh, I just appreciate everybody, the health staff, they've been preparing protocols. So thank you everybody for collaborating. The principals, the district leadership teams, you put in just hundreds of hours, so thank you. Um, with this presentation, uh, we have one more part to it and it is, um, you did approve delaying the start of the school year with our 2020-21 school calendar. And we want uh, you to take a look at the changes with swapping out of some dates. And with that, I will turn the time over to Mark Germerhausen and Matt Kraft. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Stivlin, Superintendent Lansfeld, and members of the board and cabinet. I'm Mark Germerhausen, principal of Brookview Elementary School. I have the pleasure tonight to talk about some of the proposed changes to our calendar for the 2020-21 school year. Once the board approved delaying school um, one week, we had a group of district administration meet with representatives from the SCAA to um, propose a few changes. The calendar that you see here on your left are our proposed changes. We had to build the calendar based off the hybrid model. The hybrid model is the most complex, but it also allows us to transition easily to in-person or distance learning, no matter what model our district is running. So what we have done is the school year has moved back one week. So instead of starting August 31st, it is now starting on Tuesday, September 8th. Now, what I wanna do is take you to the bottom of the screen first. So one of the things that we have to do as a calendar committee is make sure we balance the calendar all throughout the school year. So we look at the semesters to make sure the semesters are balanced, have equal number. We look at each quarter to make sure they're balanced. So our quarter and semester classes at the secondary level will have equal number of days. 
This year, we also have to balance our A, B, and C days as well, not only within the semesters, but within the quarters and also within um, each of the days to make sure they're equal. So as you look at the calendar here, the salmon days are A days, the gray days are B days, and the maroon days are C days. So based on the calendar that was approved last November, we use that as our base calendar. Then with the um, decision to move it back one week, we had, we exchanged November 2nd, January 19th, February 16th, December 23rd, and March 26th as um, the days for the first week. Now with starting school a week later, that also changed our first quarter and second quarter end of grading periods. So the end of first quarter date moved from October 30th down to November 13th and the end of second semester or the end of, or excuse me, the end of second quarter or first semester was moved from January 15th to the 22nd. These proposed changes allow us to have an equal number of days throughout the year within our quarters, our semesters, and our A and B days. There is one note here, election day, November 3rd. We kept it a C day on the original calendar. We did not have school that day because many of our school sites are host to election sites. So we wanted to keep that a no school day. So currently it is a C day for students. After the MEA break, depending on the instructional model we are in, if we are in person, we may look to move the November 3rd um, C day with the November 13th grading day so that we make sure we do not have school on Tuesday, November 3rd for election day. But as of right now, we kept it. And the reason we kept the grading day on Friday, November 13th is to have a grading day after the end of first semester to allow our teachers to wrap, or excuse me, the end of first quarter to allow our teachers to wrap up the first quarter and then get ready and plan for second quarter. One other thing that you will notice is the beginning of the school year looks a little different, both secondary and elementary. From an elementary perspective, last year, in the past couple of years, our Ready, Set, Go conferences were held the first two days of school. In this calendar, we are proposing to have the first four days of school for Ready, Set, Go conferences. The reason being is twofold. The first one, it'll allow our staff more time to meet with students and families as we transition to the school year this year. With the way school ended last year, we thought building those relationships was very important and allow more time to meet with our families and meet with our students before the start of the school year. The second reason is it allows us to space out those meetings more evenly across four days. In the past, the meetings have been 20 to 30 minutes long and it was one family right after the next. And by spacing it out, it will allow us to clean the rooms and to clean some of the touch points. So when the next family comes, we have a clean surface and a clean facility for that next family to arrive to allow us to plan cleaning time for the next family before they come with Ready, Set, Go conferences. Also, we will allow families an online option. So if they do not want to come in to Ready, Set, Go, they will still have the same time. We will just do it virtually. And then also, if it is a nice day, we could even do those outside if we wish. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Matt Kraft, who will talk about the secondary transition the first two days of school. Thank you, Mark. Uh, good evening, everyone. You know, for the past three years, um, the district has made a significant commitment to transitioning sixth graders and ninth graders into their new buildings at the start of the school year. And we are grateful for that commitment, for that appropriate transition for students. Um, this year leads to uh, some challenges with the opening of the school year when we put students into A cohort and B cohorts. And so what we want to do at the sixth grade level with Webb and at the ninth grade level with Link Crew is we want to attempt to emulate the, um, the appropriate start of the school year by having two days of transition, one for our A sixth and ninth graders and one um, for our B sixth and ninth graders. Um, while we're taking these two days of important transition activities, relationships, um, getting students acclimated to their new school, our seventh and eighth graders and our 10th, 11th and 12th graders that have already been to some degree acclimated to their buildings, 
we'll be starting the school year with C days or distance learning days. And that, uh, that gives everyone the same start on Tuesday, September 8th. But um, again, it allows our sixth graders and ninth graders to actually physically come into the building and for us to um, really focus on them and getting them off to a great start. So thank you. And, and just one reminder, after you look at the calendar is the A days. So if, if my student is an, a student that's in the A, they are go to school Monday, Tuesday, or excuse me, Monday and Wednesday. And then they are learning at home, distance learning on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. The C days are still learning days. And if I am, uh, my child is a, a B student, they go to school on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then they would learn at home on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. If we were to move in person, all the A, B, and C days become student contact school days. If we go to distance learning, all the A, B, and C days become student contact days as well. So this is the most complex model with the hybrid when it's split up between A and B. This calendar can easily pivot to both in-person and distance learning, whatever our instructional model needs. 